Hello, everyone. We'll get started shortly. So for the PowerPoint, um, it's going to be the same thing where they're going to have to search for it on another. Hello and welcome, Crow Canyon friends. My name is Dylan Schwent, and I work for Crow Canyon as the Director of Information Systems. Crow Canyon Archaeological Center is a nonprofit organization based in Southwest Colorado. Our mission is to make the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. Crow Canyon staff are actively working on this mission right now by conducting and sh sharing research, creating educational opportunities like this webinar, and working with our Native American partners to appropriately share indigenous knowledge. You can support us in our mission by going to our website, crowcanyon.org, and clicking on the Support Crow Canyon button. Also, please check out our YouTube channel to see more free webinars like this one. Thank you for your support, and we hope that you enjoy today's flip mapping demonstration. For those of us watching this webinar live, you should see a button on your screen that says Q&A, where you can type in questions. Feel free to ask questions at any time, and I will do my best to get you some answers when the timing is right. We have multiple cameras in this webinar. In the upper right corner of your screen, you can toggle between speaker view and gallery view to view the different cameras. Before Tyson starts his demonstration, please allow me to share a few words about him. Tyson was introduced to Crow Canyon in an, on an elementary school field trip, and now 2020 marks his fifth year as one of Crow Canyon's talented educators. Tyson follows his passion and interest as an archeologist specializing in prehistoric lithic technologies. He is a lot of fun to work with, and I know him as a very talented educator that truly cares about people and our colorful shared history. He has worked in many areas of the country, but his passion lies in the archaeology of southwestern Colorado, where he grew up. He is an avid flint napper, and as you will see, Tyson loves what he does. Ladies and gentlemen, your lithics extrovert and Crow Canyon educator, Tyson Hughes. Hi, Tyson. Hi, Dylan. Thank you for that. Oh, you need to... Hi, Dylan. Thank you for that. Uh, one thing I might need your help with real quick, though, Dylan, is this is not swiveling down again. The view isn't great, but hello folks. Um, so I work here at Crow Canyon Archaeological Center as an educator, um, but I'm actually a recovering archaeologist. I did uh, uh, cultural resource management for a little over a decade in, in nine different, different states in the country. And um, something that I found really useful when I was doing archaeology um, was my understanding of flint napping. Um, so flint napping, uh, some of you may, may know this, but for those of you who don't, it is a process, it's a reductive process, where you are intentionally breaking a stone to get a desired tool form. Um, so the way it, it, it works is you have to have a very specific type of rock. It can't just be any piece of sandstone. Um, it has to be a, a silicate. There are some rocks that, that are flakeable that are not silicates, uh, but really, really the vast majority of them are, are silicates and those rocks are able to be manipulated um, in, in ways to, to make formal tools. Um, now there is flint. Flint is a type of silicate that is, uh, that is useful for these sorts of applications, but it's not the only type. Um, flint is one of, 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 of many different types of rocks that are used. Um, in old world archaeology, often if you're talking about an artifact uh, that's made using this process, they refer to it as being made of flint. Um, you may have heard of, of gun flints, um, things like that. Uh, here in the, the United States, archaeologists think about it a little differently. Um, we like to really focus more on where that rock is coming from, the geologic formation specifically. So we may have 
um, a Dakota Formation Silicified Sandstone or a Morrison Formation Silicified Mudstone or a Chalcedony um, or a Silicified Wood or something like that, um, but it does have the same properties uh, that Flint does. Um, the word nap literally means to break rock. So um, flint napping is literally just breaking that type of rock. Now this technology, um, it's not new. In fact, it's much older than humanity. Uh, the first stone tools that have been identified, um, they claim they're 3.3 million years old. Um, and that's, I, those were found, I believe, in Kenya. So that's before really we were even of the, the genus Homo. Um, and so even before we were, we were people, there were creatures apparently in our, our uh, ancestral lineage that were manipulating stone and making tools out of them. Uh, this process is seen all over the world. It is something that is ubiquitous in prehistoric cultures all over the planet. And so um, I, I think it's a really, really valuable tool for archeologists, especially um, to understand how these people lived, what, what their daily uh, life was, was about, um, what they, created these tools for, what they use them for, where they even got the materials for them. Um, now, here in North America, we typically talk about the earliest people being, we refer to them as Paleo-Indians. And for a long time, people were pretty confident that the first Paleo-Indians here were Clovis people, and that they uh, created this very distinctive type of projectile point. And I'll show up a cast example one right now, and you find these all over North America. Um, it's a very unique stool, uh, stone tool type. Yeah, I'll show it down on this camera too. A little washed out. But one of the really, really good characteristic clues on these points is they have what's called a channel flake or a flute that comes up the base of the point. And that is for hafting it onto a, a spear or an atlatl dart. Um, these points generally, you know, 10, 12, 15,000 years ago um, are abundant. But it is recently kind of coming to light that there were people in North America that may have been making stone tools uh, much earlier than that. And so the science is still developing, um, but there is some evidence that, that I have um, read and heard about that there may have been people creating stone tools uh, as far back as 130,000 years ago um, here in North America. So that could rewrite the prehistory of our continent a little bit if that's the case. Do you have a question? Is that authentic or correct? This is a cast. So this actually, and I can, I can show it under the light again if we want to talk about this. It's not so washed out. This is a, a cast of a, a Clovis projectile point that I believe was found in Utah. And um, this is a cast that you can get from a place called lithicscastinglab.com, which is where a lot of the casts that we use for our educational programs and a lot of the casts in my personal collection have come from as well. Um, since we're talking about casts of Clovis points, I'll show you this one too. This is the Rutz Clovis, and this is a cast of the largest Clovis point ever found, and it was found in Washington, and it is made out of rainbow obsidian. So you can see a lot of these Clovis points are pretty substantial. They're large, and uh, the reason being is that the type of game that these Paleo-Indian hunters uh, were, were going after were megafauna, right? Um, these species went extinct, uh, around 6,000 BC, uh, end of the Pleistocene, and we see, you know, cultures adapting, things transitioning to um, smaller projectile points, things that made more sense for the, the, the game that they were, they were hunting. So as a general rule, as you go chronologically, projectile points tend to go from larger to smaller. And there's also a reflection there in, in the type of projectile technology. Uh, where these Clovis hunters might have been using thrusting spears, perhaps atlatls and darts. Um, archaic people later were using probably atlatls and darts and, and hurling them with, with great um, speed. Uh, and then eventually, uh, around 500 AD in the Southwest anyways, uh, that technology was more or less replaced by the bow and arrow. And um, as you can imagine, 
if you're shooting an arrow, um, the projectile on the point on the tip of that arrow is going to be smaller than the one on top of a, a dart or a spear. I'm not the best at so yeah. Totally. Let's tell people if they have trouble seeing, we have more than one camera here. And um, so uh, folks can, if you go to the upper right hand corner of your screen, you should be able to, um, to adjust the, you should be able to go to gallery view. Okay. Yeah, it's a little better. See what my hands are doing now. All right. So now a lot of people, they, they, they are familiar with um, projectile points in the sense that they have seen an arrowhead or, or a spear point or something like that. And perhaps, you know, it looks something like this, right? Or I can put it down here even. It's a pretty common form. These uh, projectile points is what archaeologists like to call them. Um, you know, they're ubiquitous. Uh, they are found all over the world. Um, but they're certainly not the only type of tool that, that people were creating prehistorically. Uh, projectile points are unique in the sense that they, they have characteristics that can be um, attributed to certain time periods or cultures. So projectile points can be a diagnostic tool if we're trying to understand how old a site is or um, what culture we're, we're studying there. Um, but that's really not the only thing they were making. A lot of the tools uh, that were produced, in fact, way more tools than projectile points, were things like scrapers, um, expedient knives, drills, um, chopper tools, um, saws. So you can make a whole host of implements using this technology. And the idea is, is that if you're manipulating this rock in a certain way, you can get a nice edge on it that's going to be useful for whatever that task is that you're, that you're going for. So I'm going to be demonstrating flip mapping for you guys here today. And I'm going to go over the toolkit a little bit, just right out of the gates here. We'll talk a little bit about the source material. So what I'm holding right here is a piece of obsidian. And obsidian is a really, really good uh, material for flint napping. It's often referred to as volcanic glass. Um, and it's essentially, you know, it's lava that, that cooled down or, or magma that cooled down uh, in a very specific way. And you create this, this, this nice homogenous um, structure that, that is, is very e easy to nap. It's easily manipulatable. Um, now, Obsidian is a great tool source, but it's also something that's not found everywhere. So here in southwestern Colorado, we don't really have any natural sources of obsidian. When we find obsidian in the archaeological record here, that's really important to us because that indicates trade. That tells us that that resource was coming from somewhere else and ending up here in whatever form we find it. Um, most of the obsidian that we find here in, in the Four Corners area comes from um, hundreds of miles away in the Jemez Mountains in New Mexico. Uh, there's some that's come from all the way in the western border of Utah near Nevada. So these stones do travel a great distance um, to get places, and that tells archaeologists a lot. That teaches us a lot about um, the range that these people had, whether it be seasonal migrations or whether interactions with, with other communities um, or uh, trade, something along those lines. So just finding this here in Southwest Colorado, knowing that it's obsidian, we would be able to say that it's an artifact, right? It is not a naturally occurring rock here. Now there are some other things on this rock that would tell archaeologists that this is an artifact. You'll notice that this kind of tan colored area here, is, we call this cortex. And this is the exterior of the rock that had been weathered for millions of years and gets really kind of a beat up appearance. Now, if you break into the middle of that, you can see that it looks very different on the inside. And these types of breaks that we're seeing here are not the types of breaks that happen naturally, right? So the way that these silicates work, the way that they break is, is it's kind of based on a, um, a, pr a principle that I like to compare to uh, a BB hitting a, a plate glass window. And I think, Dylan, you have a slide that might, might illustrate this a little bit better. But it's called a Hertzian cone. And um, for those of you who have seen 
uh, a BB hitting a plate, gla a, a plate glass window. You'll notice that where the BB hits, um, there's not necessarily a big fracture, but on the other side of the glass, there's a cone, a conical piece that gets, that gets popped out from that force. That force kind of exerts outwardly, um, conically. The same thing happens um, with a piece of rock. Uh, that, that Hertzian cone can create a, a conchoidal fracture and it allows you to um, uh, accurately and, and comfortably break pieces of this rock off and shape it if you know what you're doing. You can move to the next slide if you want, Dylan. And this next slide here, this is a, a great poster that my colleague Paul Ermigiotti, um actually hand drew. And it, I think, has some really good illustrations of, of how this process uh, looks and different attributes of a projectile point. So I did want to show this slide um, uh, just to give you guys, you know, some good visual aids, um, since a lot of what I'm doing you may not be able to see too well with, with how far away the camera is. Um, and we can come back to this slide if we need to, if you guys have any specific questions about any of this stuff. But what this does is it sort of outlines the process and uh, sort of the, the attributes, the things that archeologists look for when we're identifying or describing these tools. So I have my source material, I have my obsidian, but I need some tools to actually start manipulating it, to start working it. And one of the most important tools in this process is a hammer stone. It really can just be a cobble. Um, I find that uh, the, the density of the stone, the type of the stone, um, does have a bearing on its, its efficacy um, to, with certain types of silicates. So for example, this is a relatively soft sandstone cobble, river cobble, which is really good for working things like obsidian. Obsidian is um, exceedingly sharp, but it's also kind of brittle. It's not really a strong stone. And so if you're using a much harder cobble than this, you're gonna end up just crushing the edge of that rock rather than getting that force to translate or transfer into there and detach a flake in a predictable manner. Um, if I was flit napping something harder like quartzite, I would probably wanna find myself a little bit more of a granitic um, river cobble or something those long, along those lines. So that hammer stone is going to be used largely to get that piece detached from the core that I will then be able to start turning into a, a tool. And that hammer stone will allow me to get it shaped and do a lot of the uh, initial thinning um, and that sort of thing. Once I have it to what archaeologists would call a biface, something that is sort of uniform, uh, maybe triangular, leaf-shaped, and uh, has, has the properties that I would be looking for for whatever tool that is, uh, like a projectile point, I would switch over to another tool to finish it off. And this is an antler tine. This is just a deer antler that has been cut off. And you can use deer antler to pressure flake, to take off smaller flakes, to have a more controlled um, approach to, to shaping or finalizing that product. Um, and lastly, I have some leather here. Now, this is hopefully gonna help keep me from cutting myself. Um, a word of caution, you guys will notice that I am not wearing gloves and I am not wearing any protective goggles. Um, and that is because I have been doing this for many, many years now. And I am experienced enough that I feel that uh, that actually is an encumbrance, um, wearing gloves and, and goggles. And so if you are trying this for yourself, definitely don't, don't do as I'm doing. Get yourself some gloves and some goggles and, uh, and do it the safe way. <laughs> All right. We have a question from an aspiring plant Let's hear it. He wants to know uh, what value can be gleaned from examining casts. Casts. That's a good question. So, you know, for an artifact like this Clovis point, for example, I'm not going to be able to just go to a museum and access this necessarily, right? Um, I, I could submit a research request, I could go through all those channels and maybe I would I'd get an opportunity to actually go to the curation facility and look at this projectile point under a microscope. Um, these casts are really useful for educational purposes. So the fact that um, 
I don't, nor will I ever probably own a real Clovis point. Um, this is a way that I can at least show people what they look like, talk about some of the, the characteristics, some of the attributes on them. Um, casts, I think, are an excellent educational tool, and really uh, the, the, the quality of these things is, is pretty spectacular. So you can hold the real artifacts next to the real cast and sometimes not be able to tell the difference between the two. Um, so really largely just for educational purposes, but I also want to point out that, that you know, a lot of people um, historically have collected projectile points, collected arrowheads and spear points, and that there are some ethical issues with that, that there are some problems um, uh, morally with, with possessing something like that, something of antiquity that's, that's most likely not a part of your culture. Um, and so casts are a way that you can, you can kind of have, have that same connection um, to be able to learn from these things or appreciate them or understand them without actually owning the relic itself, I guess. All right. Okay, so to get going here, um, I'm gonna start out talking about my core. And you'll notice that this core has this cortex on it where it has been, been beat up, where it has been weathered by, by the elements for a really long time. Now I was looking at this core earlier and I noticed that there was a platform here. There was a spot here that I thought I could predictably direct force towards and get a flake to detach off that would be usable for the tool that I wanna make. My first attempt was that one, which is a fine flake, absolutely usable flake, not as big as I was going for. My second attempt was also not as large as I was going for, but my third attempt, I was able to detach this rather sizable flake. And the reason I like to use big pieces like this is for my demonstrations is so hopefully you guys can see a little bit um, of what I'm doing, see a little bit of my actions with that hammer stone and with the pressure flaking. Um, so I have my flake, this piece that has been detached from the core. If we found this in an archeological site, we would already know this is an artifact, right? It has some very characteristic um, features on it. You'll notice that there's sort of some, some rippling going down here. That's that force, that's that, that uh, conchoidal fracture, the, the, the pressure from that rock being, me um, hitting it with a rock being translated through the core and detaching it off. This is not something that happens in nature. The only instance where you would see this type of fracture on a rock in nature is if a certain rock fell on the exact certain specifically perfect type of rock in just the right way. So, um, you know, if a rock tumbled off a cliff and hit a cobble of obsidian, um, maybe it could break something like this. Otherwise, this type of breakage is really, really automatically indicative of human behavior. And so even if we're not looking at formal tools, whether they're projectile points, whether they're scrapers, knives, drills, um, the debitage, the flakes, the byproducts, all of these pieces that, that are kind of uh, left behind also tell us a lot about what people uh, were doing there. So you'll notice that, that this rock, this flake that I've detached, it's not really looking much like a projectile point right now, right? If you think about what would be good for a projectile point, you want it to be symmetrical, um, you want it to be aerodynamic, you want it to be sharp, and you want a hafting element on it. You want some way that you can attach that to either an arrow like that, or maybe the tip of a spear or a dart like that, or maybe you're trying to make a knife and you wanna attach it to a handle like this. Either way, we have a fair amount of work to thin this rock out and get it shaped the right way. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go around the edges with my hammer stone. And I'm not sure if you guys can see that. And I'm really just going back and forth, roughing up these sharp edges. And there's two reasons for this. One is make them a little less sharp so I'm less likely to cut myself. But also this strengthens the edge. So if, if I left this really, really thin, really, really brittle, and I tried to take a flake off of it, I would end up just crushing the edge of that, that, that rock. 
what our or what flitnappers look for is they look for platforms. They want surfaces on here that are they're actually flat enough to to co collect that energy and direct it into the rock. And so I start by just manipulating the stone like this, going around, taking flakes off. And you can see I'm hitting it, kind of a glancing blow with my sandstone, hammer stone, and the flake detaches from the underside like that. And if I continue to go around this piece that way, I can get it thinned out um, in a way that, that hopefully will allow me to turn it into a usable projectile point. You can see how it's starting to work. There's a rule in flint napping. It's three strikes and you're out. If you hit a spot three times and it doesn't break, don't hit it a fourth because it might break the whole thing in half. However, I don't always follow that rule. Ha, huh. and sometimes I should have. That was not a good break. You can always keep looking around the edges, looking for more opportunities to get flakes. Now, as you can see, this is a reductive process, so there's really not a lot of room for error. It's not like if I accidentally take too big of a flake off of one spot, I can just put it back on and start over. It's sort of like um, sculpting. So if you think about um, Michelangelo sculpting David, you know, somewhere in that block of marble, Michelangelo saw David somewhere in this block of obsidian. I see a projectile point. Not exactly sure where it's hiding yet, but we'll get there. Now, one of the cool things about obsidian is how incredibly sharp it is. So, I'm being foolish, I'm not wearing gloves right now, but uh, any of these flakes, any of these pieces that I'm breaking off, these are super useful tools already. Um, and really, most of what we find in the archeological record are these flakes, these waste byproducts, if you will. We call them debitage, um, and we can classify them in any number of ways, but if all I needed was a blade for cutting something, that one swipe of the hammer stone created this blade, and this blade is sharp enough to cut right through leather. So, not bad. In fact, you can break obsidian to be uh, many times sharper than steel. I have heard anecdotally that uh, obsidian was used um, in eye surgery before lasers were really popular. We're starting to get somewhere. Uh-oh. Bit off a little more than I could chew on that one. So you guys, I'll show you this. I don't know if you can see it very well, but it looks like there might have been a little bit of a, a fissure, uh, an impurity in the rock here, and it broke really, really kind of unexpectedly, um, which is all part of the process, all part of the fun. So. Nothing that can't be fixed. Just going to take a little more work. So I apologize if there's lulls in my talking here. Um, sometimes I do actually have to concentrate a little bit not to cut myself. <laughs> I had another flint napper friend told me that 
uh, there was a study done. I don't know how they did it. I guess they must have hooked probes up to a, a flint napper's brain somehow. And they were tracking what, what their brain was doing while they were flint napping. And I guess what they found out is that flint napping actually gets more pieces or more parts of your brain working simultaneously than, than almost anything else that they know of. So maybe that harkens back to our prehistory a little bit. Well, that was a good one. So you can see, let's switch over to this camera. Oops. There we go. So you can see that I'm starting to thin it down. I'm starting to get some of these flakes to travel across the piece. And I'm taking some of this cortex off. And in the process, I'm thinning it out. And that's, that's desirable. That's what you want if you want a projectile point. So right now, this is really in the early stages of um, thinning. But a lot of the um, a lot of the bifaces we find are not you know completed projectile points. Uh, a lot of a lot of the stuff we find is either in in some form of of reduction or perhaps that's just all it was ever supposed to be. Now, flint napping is a great hobby. It's something that I definitely encourage people to, to take up if they're interested. Um, and it's also really, really useful. Once again, if, if you're interested in archeology span and trying to understand more about lithic artifacts in the archeological record, uh, if you actually start flint napping, um, sometimes a lot of, the, a lot of that, uh, a lot of those aha moments just kind of come to you where you are breaking a rock and then you notice it fractures a certain way and then maybe later you're in the field recording a site and you see a rock that seems to have fractured the same way and you have a better idea of what might have happened there, what that might actually mean. We have some questions. Let's hear them. <clears throat> Um, one is, do you take the Mohs hardness scale into consideration when you're considering what rocks to use? Um, I don't really look at the Mohs hardness scale very much <laughs> for individual rocks. I kind of trust what I already know about um, types of rocks that work pretty well. So, you know, I was talking about obsidian. It registers pretty low on the Mohs hardness scale, um, it, and that's why it's kind of relatively easy to break. Um, now something like this, this is a, a silicified sandstone and that would register much higher on the hardness scale. And um, to be honest, I'm not a skilled enough flint napper um, or a strong enough flint napper to really, really confidently break rocks that are that hard. So most of what I, I choose for my flint napping are things like obsidian or chalcedony or narbona past chert, uh, things like that that are a little bit softer. So, so yes, I guess I do take that into consideration. What about, um, what are rocks that are locally here in Southwestern, local in Southwestern Colorado because obsidian is not found locally. Yeah, so we're fortunate here in, uh, in Southwestern Colorado to have many different layers of rock that are kind of naturally exposed. We have a lot of exposed geology. A lot of geologic stratigraphy is just present on the landscape. Um, and as a result, we have an, a number of really useful uh, tool stones locally, um, the majority of which do come out of the Dakota Formation and the Morrison Formation. Um, and, uh, you know, varying degrees of quality. So there are 
some stones from these formations that, it, that I could flint nap pretty easily. Um, there's some stones from these formations like that, that one that I just held up there that I probably wouldn't be able to approach. Um, so those are probably the two main ones. We do see brushy basin chert here. Uh, we, we see some imported materials as well. Uh, Jasper from Utah. Um, those sorts of things. But, but really, I would say for Southwest Colorado, predominantly um, Morrison and Dakota formations. And those are solidified sandstones, silt stones. And pretty decent, pretty decent for flint napping, really. Some of our Mac users are having trouble seeing the, the other camera, but I think most folks are able to to see that. So just huh. as we toggle back and forth, just if you clo use a close up on the other camera, let's go back and do that one too. Do, okay. Do that one too. Okay. I'm one of those Mac users. I'm a Mac guy. All right. I need to get a little bit more aggressive here with this. There we go. Now we're cooking with gas. Now often I can produce a projectile point in a, about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, I think that if you were depending on this technology for your survival, you probably wouldn't need to allow yourself that much time. Um, having said that, you know, maybe in the winter months when they didn't have a lot else to do, maybe they'd want to spend a lot of time. Uh, maybe in their pit houses or their kivas or their wiki ups working on this stuff. All right. I'm sort of getting it there. So you'll notice I'm doing a lot of grinding, and once again, I'm I'm trying to prepare those platforms so that they'll transmit that force, that energy, a little bit more efficiently through the rock. So as another safety note, I really should be wearing a respirator as well while I'm doing this. Um, flint napping inside is not ideal. Uh, the weather here is not great, and so that's why we're doing it inside. Outside is definitely preferable. Uh, because I am generating a tremendous amount of silica dust when I'm doing this grinding and that's not good to be breathing in. So um, just another cautionary message there. If you are trying this at home, use the proper PPE. Okay. So I'm going to try to hold this up a little bit closer so you guys can see. I'm getting it kind of thinned out sort of shaped the way that I might want it. And I have just a little bit more work I'm going to do here with this hammer stone before I switch over to pressure. Where do you get your material? For example, where'd you get your obsidian? So this obsidian that I'm working today, I actually got at a, a rock shop here in Cortez. Um, so you, these are things you can buy at rock shops. You can uh, order stone even online on Etsy or eBay. Um, I, you know, there are, are places where you can gather nappable stone and you can do it legally on public land, but you really, really have to be careful to check out the rules of whatever that uh, jurisdiction is, um, about where you can collect and how much you can collect. Um, so to be safe, normally, you know, I just, I just get my rock at the rock, at the rock shop. It's a little bit easier. Um, but there's really been a, a resurgence of interest in this technology. Uh, for a long time, you know, I, I, I think probably most of the 1800s and 1900s, people didn't really seem to, to care too much about this technology. It had kind of gone out of favor. It had been replaced by other things. Um, it wasn't, you know, until really the last half, I would say of the 20th century that there's a, 
a kind of a big resurgence of interest in this. And as a result, there are many, many people out there who are, who are doing this recreationally um, or educationally like I am um, or, for, uh, or for money as well. There are people who make projectile points and, and, and sell them. Um, and as a result, these resources have become pretty accessible. Um, so you can get actually flint napping kits on Etsy where they will send you all the tools you need and maybe even some of the, the sample rock or source rock. What type of cost would be involved in? It's a good question. Good question. I don't think they're terribly expensive materials, you know. I mean, most, most everything uh, you can find. You know, if you have a, a riverbed, you can find cobbles. Um, if you have access to deer antler, you can get a deer antler and, and leather the same way. Um, so I, I encourage people actually to really research making their own tools, research what tools uh, would work well for them and just make their own. All right, so I have this kind of thinned down to a point where I, I'm gonna start shaping it with some pressure flaking. Um, ideally, I would want to get that a little bit thinner. I had some trouble. You can see that there's a couple points here where those flakes did not travel as far as I wanted them to, and they just sort of checked out. It's called a hinge fracture. And um, as a result, you know, that's, that's less than ideal. But for demonstration purposes, I'm going to go ahead and push forward and start showing you guys some pressure. So I mentioned that they use deer antler. Prehistoric people here predominantly use deer antler. And the pressure flaking is, is really similar to the percussion flaking in the sense that I'm looking for that spot, that platform, um, whatever that, that piece of that edge of that rock is that seems like it would uh, be able to handle that force and break off a piece predictably, right? Rather than striking the rock with this antler though, I put it right on the edge and I apply pressure this way. And you can see that you can get much smaller flakes off this way. So you can have quite a bit more control using this, this pressure flaking technique. And that's why it's really good for sort of finishing the points. Um, now these are, these are not the only two techniques out there. There's percussion flaking, there's pressure flaking, but I do wanna talk about another tech, another uh, uh, couple tools here. One of which is an antler billet. A lot of archeologists like to use antler billets for percussion as well. And you would use this similarly to that hammer stone. You would be using it to take large flakes off like that. I'm not a huge fan of billets. I, I don't typically use them, but um, they are useful for a lot of flint nappers. Um, there's another technique and there is evidence in the archeological record that this was being used really specifically uh, in the Southwest at, in basket maker two times, it seems like um, folks were, were using this technique perhaps. Um, and it is called indirect percussion. So it's sort of a hybrid between the two. You have what we would call a punch. This is a piece of antler. Um, more typically they would use a piece of sheep horn, bighorn sheep. And you make a punch, you put it on the edge of where you want that flake to come off of, and then you strike it. And this technique is one that I am struggling with, that I have not really done very well with. But uh, it creates a, a sort of unique flake scar, and we do find these punches in the archeological record, um, even with little bits of silica embedded in the tips that tell us that that's really what they were used for. Um, antler does work great. It, it does the job, but I'm going to cheat a little bit for expedience sake. I'm going to switch over to a composite tool that, that uh, um, we have here at Crow Canyon, and it's really just a wooden dowel with a uh, piece of copper embedded in the tip of it. Um, now, the reason this is copper and not steel is, 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 once again, there is sort of a balance between the hardnesses of the tool and the rock that you're flaking. And if I were using a steel nail, that might just crush the edge of that stone. Whereas if I'm using copper, the copper gives a little bit, maybe even um, gets indented a little bit and, and works much better to carry that force through the rock without just obliterating the edge. So I'm gonna cheat. 
I'm going to use a copper tool and see if I can get this puppy down into some better shape. What are you looking for in a platform? In a platform? So, actually, this may be a good time for this. So if we look at this right here, here's our, here's our core, right? And you'll notice that there's these ridges that happen when you start taking pieces off of that core. What you're really looking for is, is a, a, a place on the top of one of these ridges where you can hit and direct that force down at the correct angle. Now this platform would look, would manifest into something like this on this flake right here. Um, the angle of that platform is really, really important. So th the angle of this part of the rock compared to this part of the rock is, is, is paramount. And that's really what, you, what you're, you're aiming for when, when you're trying to predictably manipulate this rock. Um, you know, I wish I could say, exactly which angle and exactly how much pressure to apply to get um, those flakes to come off of that platform. But so much of this is really just practice. It's muscle memory and it's reading the rock. Um, and so on this piece, for example, that I'm working on, maybe let's switch over to this camera. You can see right here, where if I strike this spot, it's a little funny. I'm oh, having a hard time getting it here at right angle. There we go. It should be that if I strike this spot right here, that angle, the platform angle right there, is appropriate enough that a flake should be able to attach from the other side. And I'll hold it up here for you Mac users as well. This gives you kind of an idea. So if I take that platform and I put my pressure flaking tool on it, it's really just, you know, it's, it's a spot on the edge of the rock. That's all it is. But the geometry, the angle is, is correct. And it'll allow me to, to actually, um, once again, predictably detach a flake. Good questions, folks. Keep them coming. I'm liking this. Did both genders nap tools? Did what? Both genders. Both genders? You know, I've gotten that question before from my students, and I always like to point out that in prehistoric times, this is a terribly useful technology. Um, once again, it's not just for projectile points. It's not just for hunting. It's for making scrapers, knives, drills, choppers, any number of tools. And so I have a hard time believing that it was just one gender that was doing the flint napping. Um, if you, you know, look at ethnographical reports of, of say, um, Pueblos in the Southwest, it's males are the ones who do the flint napping. And there is a lot of sort of gender division in the roles sometimes with, with Pueblo groups. Um, prehistorically, though, this seems like a technology that every parent would want their child to at least have a rudimentary knowledge of um, whether they're boy, girl, or other. So I don't really think that, that, it's, a, that it's something you can really attribute to any specific gender. But who knows? Maybe it was, was only the grandmothers who were allowed to flint nap. You'll hear by my grunting there that sometimes it does take a tremendous amount of force to get these flakes to detach the way you want them to. I think that flint napping is also the time when cursing was invented. Because very often those sorts of moments present themselves. I'll do my best to keep the language clean today.
So a platform at this stage is a blunt protuberance along the edge. You got it. That's a, that's a great definition. Blunt protuberance. The angle of it, of course, is, is, is really important. But. What's the benefit of using a punch or a billet compared to a hammerstone? So I don't see any benefit necessarily because I'm not good at using uh, a punch with a billet or uh, a, just a billet in general. I find that um, hard hammer stones, cobbles work just as well for me. Um, in fact, much better than billets. A lot of our uh, flint nappers that I've, I've, I've known prefer billets. They actually say that these work a lot better for them. So it's just kind of how you were taught, how, you, um, how your style is. Now, when it comes to indirect percussion, when it comes to actually using these punches, I, I, I've heard that, and I guess I can understand this, that it's kind of the best of both worlds, right? You have the, the force, you have more force because it's a percussion, but you can more precisely direct that force because you're using an intermediary tool. This punch allows you to take that greater impact and direct it into a, a smaller place, right? So I think that there definitely are benefits to it. However, um, doing this solo is really proved challenging. And um, my colleagues and I have, have experimented with it and none of us have gotten really successful with it. The most successful um, attempts I've seen of anyone flint napping with indirect percussion um, are from a gentleman who uh, came to our campus a while back and did a demonstration. And he actually sat on the ground and used his feet to hold the piece that he was working. Um, the reason being is that if you have the piece that you're holding, the leather, the punch, the billet, and only two hands, it becomes a little unwieldy, right? Um, there's also ethnographic evidence, reports of people using indirect percussion um, tandemly in pairs. So people would not just be, you know, individually flint napping something, uh, they'd be working together. One person would be placing the punch and another individual would be, would be striking it with the billet. So I, I do kind of wonder whether that approach is, um, you know, A, something that you can only do if you're using your feet or, or, or a third arm if you have it or another person. Or just more practice. And that may be what I'm missing. How do you deal with step fractures? I cry a little bit, <laughs> but then I get over it. So for example, we have a pretty nasty little step fracture kind of right here, where rather than that flake passing all the way through the piece, it just kind of stopped and bent up and popped. Now, typically what you have to do is you have to look for another angle, another direction on that rock to approach that and drive a flake to break that step off from the opposite side. Um, I have actually gotten pretty successful at using a technique where I take this pressure flaking tool and I put it right on that flat break, right where that hinge fracture occurred. And I direct pressure sort of downward and I get the remainder of that flake to pop off. Um, I have heard of archaeologists or uh, flint nappers that are, are good enough that when they have a step fracture like that, they take that piece they place it back there where it was and strike it again in the exact same way and can get that flake to travel all the way across. Um, so step fractures are definitely not what you want, but um, you can typically find a way to work around them. All right, I'll try to get moving here a little quicker since I'm running out of time. Woo! Going back to my hammer stone here, I'm just gonna do bit of shaping rather than get this thing perfectly thin I think I'm just going to work on making a usable tool time flies when you're having fun How can you tell that obsidian has come from Hemes or rather than Utah or some other source? Yeah, that, that's a great question too. Um, obsidian is, is really cool in the sense that every source of obsidian, and there are many, many sources of obsidian all over the world, looks a little bit differently. So there are 
laboratories that actually analyze this have have samples of obsidian um, that they can use as a comparative analysis or they can look at um, actual attributes of the stone using scientific procedures and figure out geographically where that rock came from. Um, so once again, terribly useful for archaeologists, um, but it, it, it does take some specialized analysis. Now, you know, I've seen enough obsidian from the Jemez Mountains and I'm aware of, of its uh, a kind of abundance, relative abundance in the archaeological record here. So in the field, I can pretty confidently probably say that something is, is you know, Jemez obsidian from the Jemez Mountains, um, or maybe it's mineral mountain obsidian from western Utah. But uh, without sending it to the lab, without actually having the uh, analysts take a look at it, um, you probably wouldn't be able to say with certainty. Who was your teacher? So I learned from my brother and my brother was self-taught in the 1990s. Um, he was really, really interested in, in Native American uh, prehistory and culture. And he would go to um, gas stations and buy the, the, the cheesy little arrowheads for a quarter or whatever they were. And then he would take them home and with a steel nail, try to shape them into, into something that looks more like what you'd actually, you know, find at an archaeological site. Um, at the time, uh, once again, there wasn't a whole lot of people doing this. And so he didn't have a tremendous amount of support um, to learn how to do it. So he was more or less self-taught. Uh, it was many years later, as I was really kind of actively pursuing a career in archaeology, that I, I took an interest in it and... Um, started training under him and and he showed me and and really a lot of the methods and approaches that I have for flint napping or, or what I've I've learned from him but he was self-taught so um, I've worked with many other flint nappers who do things very very differently than how my brother and I do and I think that's also interesting because you know if we're thinking about this in experimental archaeology terms you know we're, we're ultimately trying to figure out how they did it right how they manufactured these things. And so I think if we try many different methods, many different approaches, um, maybe at some end point we can actually compare those and come up with something meaningful. But I was taught by my brother who was self-taught, which is why the way I flint nap looks really wonky to some people. Um, a lot of people don't, don't break rock the way my brother and I do. They just hold it a little differently. How long will one projectile point last if used in a hunt? Or you know, it I, it depends on the shot, right? So if you're a really good hunter and you sink that thing in, say the neck meat of that animal, um, that point may be reusable. If you're a bad shot and you miss and you hit a rock, that may be the end of that projectile point. Um, or even if you do hit your target, if you hit your target hard enough and and it hits a piece of bone perhaps, um, then that could impact the life of the projectile point. So what we notice a lot is, is we do find projectile points that have been broken um, during manufacture, but we've also find projectile points that are broken from use. And you can see that because there is a distinct, what we call an impact fracture on the tip of the projectile point, which indicates that it was hurled at something with, with you know, great velocity and broke that way. Um, we also do see a lot of evidence that they would retool these things. So even if it did break, um, it may not be the end of that projectile point. They may be able to retool it and uh, get it back on their arrow or dart and get back to business. Generally speaking, I think these were really, really resourceful folks. And they would reuse it if they could. All right, so we can see I'm getting it kind of into a triangular shape here, getting a little bit more thinned out, sort of has a point on it. So let's see if we can send this one home.
Was fire hardened wood also a, a common way to tip arrows? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, we talk about, you know, projectile points being a, a kind of ubiquitous and definitely a very old technology, but we, we have to keep in mind that, that stones preserve in the archaeological record, right? A lot of other materials don't. Um, here in the Southwest, we're fortunate. We have alcove settings that do preserve those sorts of materials really well. And from what I understand, um, especially in the later Pueblo periods, a lot of their arrows were not uh, tipped with stone projectile points. A lot of them were kind of like this, where it is just perhaps a fire hardened piece of stick in the end of a lighter reed or a fragmite that you could, you could use as an arrow. So, you know, we, I, I, I think that projectile points are terribly interesting, but I also do like to point out that we tend to maybe exaggerate or overemphasize the importance of them. Um, I think that, you know, they make a difference, uh, but I, I, I don't think that everybody needed them, right? It's kind of a reflection of need. And if you are a, a, a Pueblo person and you're a farmer um, and you're not hunting a bison antiquus or a mastodon, then a wooden tipped arrow would be totally adequate. Um, conversely, you know, if you're a paleo Indian, maybe a, a fire hardened wooden tip on your projectile wouldn't really do you much good. Um, but those, these are not the only materials that people have used, right? I mean, people have used bone, ivory. Um, you can even grind projectile points using stones like slate. Uh, but this is just one that, that seems, to, seems to have definitely um, been around a lot for a long time and is still in the archaeological record for us to learn from. Okay. All right, guys. So I think I'm about there. I've got it kind of roughly shaped the way I want it. Now, the last thing that I need to think about with this is how I'm going to attach it to um, my spear or my arrow. And judging by the size of this, this is probably not an arrow point, right? This is going to be a dart point or uh, maybe even a thrusting spear point. So to keep it contemporary with the styles that they were using back then, rather than putting notches on this point, like you see with this one, white background, I'm going to stem this point. And what that means is I'm going to bring the shoulders in like this. And really that stem, it's going to look sort of like a Christmas tree, is going to act as the hafting element, the piece that we're going to put into um, our wooden spear or dart. And I'm going to do that, same process as the other pressure flaking, except I'm just going back and forth along the same margin. Flip it over, do the same thing. And that grinding sound, I apologize, that, that does seem to bother some people. I was doing a demonstration once and a little, little old lady said, oh my gosh, that sounds like the dentist's office. And I couldn't help but think what she was having done to her teeth that made that sort of grinding sound. Would you say obsidian is the easiest rock to flint now? I find it's the easiest. It seems to break the most predictably and easily for me. Um, some people claim that obsidian is a terrible stone to learn how to flint nap on because you, you know, you'll end up cutting yourself and like I just did. And uh, maybe that's not all that desirable, but I think obsidian is really easy to work as long, as long as you're being careful, as long as you're aware of the hazards of how sharp, how absolutely razor sharp um, it is. I think it's a, a great stone to, to use. Okay. 
All right, almost there, guys. Hang tight. We'll be hunting in no time. Let's call that good. Now really, if I was an archaic person and I was gonna use this as my projectile point, the last thing I would do is I would take my hammer stone or an abrader and I would grind the edges of this stem where I would just, we're taking those flakes off. And this sort of thing is prevalent in the archeological record. You see that they very intentionally would grind the bases of their points, stemmed points, and even earlier Paleo-Indian lancelet points, um, I think largely so that when you haft them, uh, those edges are not cutting through the sinew that you're using to uh, attach it to your, your spear or your dart. So there is a example of a stemmed, I would say late archaic projectile point. Um, maybe maybe even a Bahada if it was found in, in this neck of the woods. What tool is best for creating serration? Serration? Serration and notching, I really like to use, this is a modified antler. You see I've ground the edges down, so it's kind of at a little bit more of a point. And what that allows you to do, I'll demonstrate that for you here in a little bit. Let's try it on this piece. So if it's a really skinny tool like that, you can get those deep sort of notches or uh, denticulate flakes, as we would call it. So you can see there that I've made one little serration there. Now, if I continue to do that all the way along that edge, you know, maybe it looks sort of like a, like a comb or a brush or something like that. Um, people have, have typically talked about, you know, serrations on points having, having some sort of purpose. Um, and then maybe that purpose is for hunting or maybe that purpose is aesthetics. I think a lot of times with these, with these tools, you know, the primary purpose is primary. Um, but they are also creative people. They are also artisans and um, the, the serrations might actually just be sort of an artistic trademark. Um, I also think that if, if you were to embed um, two similar projectile points in the same animal the same way, uh, the one that had serrations would probably do a better job of um, injuring that animal to the point where it, it, it bleeds out quicker than, than maybe just the straight edge, but I don't know. That's an opportunity for experimental archeologists in the future, I think. Yeah, typically those serrated edges, those denticulate um, edges, um, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know that there's anything specifically advantageous or even culturally diagnostic that you could say about them. Well, thank you. Um, thanks again to Tyson for sharing some of his knowledge with us. And thanks to Crow Canyon for making the Union Past accessible and to all of you viewers for your interest and your questions. You can stay in touch by visiting the Crow Canyon website at crowcanyon.org, liking our videos on YouTube, and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Crow Canyon and I wish you and all of your loved ones safety, happiness, and good health. Thanks. Thank you.